This, this session is currently being recorded, recorded and will be posted later on the website. There will be a Q&A session at the end, so please add your questions in the Q&A feature and not in the chat box so that it's easier to moderate. And now I'll let Dr. Mustelin introduce our speaker for today. Okay, thanks, Danielle. So it's a real uh, pleasure and an honor to uh, introduce our grand round speaker today, uh, Dr. Caroline Jeffries. She um, uh, got her under degree, undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the uh, Trinity College uh, Dublin in Ireland and uh, went on to get a PhD in immunology in uh, 2000 from the same uh, institute. She then uh, continued for a number of years, um, I think mostly working with uh, Luke O'Neill and publishing a great deal of of interesting uh, findings and, and advances in, in innate immunity and, and signaling. She um, also did a um, postdoc at uh, Harvard Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and um, did a number of uh, visiting professorships at Amgen and a few other uh, organizations, um, uh, a, a um, company called Molecular and Cellular Therapeutics uh, she was uh, part of for, for a number of years as well. And then uh, became um, in 2015, uh, an associate professor at Cedar sinai Medical Center in uh, Los Angeles, where she still is uh, today, now as a scientific director for the Center of Research on Women's Health and Sex Differences. Um, Caroline has um, been well-funded. Uh, she has published great papers uh, over the years. Uh, I also know uh, from personal experience that she is a thoughtful and great uh, grant reviewer on, on HAI. Um, and we uh, get to see each other three times a year reviewing uh, grants. Um, her interests in research have uh, mostly been around uh, innate immune uh, responses, uh, particularly in lupus with uh, for several years a, a deep interest in uh, nucleic acid sensing um, as her main project and in parallel um, uh, metabolic and other uh, aspects of uh, immune, uh, innate immunity uh, as it relates to uh, gender differences uh, and cardiac uh, disease. So um, I'm going to hand it over to her to uh, tell us her latest story and hopefully some aspects of a nature paper that I see you have in press and we're all waiting to uh, see. So thanks for coming and, and please uh, uh, go ahead. Thanks Thomas for that um, very nice introduction and, and for your invite um, to present our work today. So most of what I'm gonna to talk to you today is actually unpublished work. Um, and Thomas has referenced the, the recent nature paper that I was involved in and I'll just briefly comment on that at the end. Um, and it, because this is a mixed audience, I thought I'd kind of take you through some of the background re regarding the importance of antiviral immune responses, particularly the type 1 interferons in, in lupus, and how changes in metabolic activity of immune cells um, can influence um, interferon production. Um, and so the two people that are featured here on this screen, Erica Montano, who um, recently graduated from my lab, um, she kickstarted this project um, for as part of her PhD, and Mamita Bose has um, taken it on as a project scientist in the lab and has um, taken it through uh, to the next stage, which um, uh, is currently funded by NIAID. Okay, so let me change this to a laser pointer. There we go. Perfect. So when I think of or teach about autoimmune disease or autoinflammatory disease, um, I really start from the point of view of tolerance and, and why tolerance is so important, both in preventing autoimmunity, but also turning off and limiting the immune response. And we have many different mechanisms of inducing tolerance um, within our immune system, you know, immunosuppressive myeloid cells, T regulatory um, cells, checkpoint pathways, et cetera. And also non-coding RNA and epigenetic regulation has been important negative regulations of, of immune responses. Um, and so the fact that so little of us, so few of us 
develop autoimmune disease during our lifetime. Um, it, it just shows how exquisitely, exquisitely effective um, our mechanisms of tolerance are in preventing autoimmunity. But when these mechanisms go wrong, i.e. they're not turned on properly, um, or they're, they're dampened in some, some way or affected by the environment, um, then, then that's when autoimmune disease can develop. Or in the case of cancer, when we, have, when we can't activate um, the immune response because these checkpoint um, pathways or tolera tolerogenic pathways are overactivated, and then that's when we get disease. And breaking tolerance um, is a multifactorial response. Um, so certainly, you know, we know that the immune response is overactivated in autoimmune disease, but what's driving that? Um, and there's a genetic component uh, for, that has been identified for most autoimmune diseases, including lupus, um, and genes that regulate antigen presentation, activation of the immune response, antiviral immune pathways. These have all been implicated in various um, autoimmune diseases. And there's also environmental factors. And key for lupus um, was the initial discovery, the initial thought that viral infection might be important in driving or triggering um, the onset of lupus. Um, but now, you know, there are other mechanisms that we know can contribute to lupus. Um, UV light exposure, for example, which is something that uh, Keith Elkhan's group has worked on um, relatively extensively. Um, Thomas himself has worked on endogenous retroviruses and, and shown that they can um, contribute to autoimmune disease and potentially break tolerance. So all of these factors basically are important in developing autoimmune disease. So lupus, um, which I'm sure I don't need to explain to this audience, is a chronic multi-system autoimmune disease. And there are visible signs of lupus that we can, we can see, such as um, skin involvement, butterfly rashes, the male rash. Um, you can also have discoid rashes as well, Raynaud syndrome. But there are you know, complications of various different organs as well. Um, so, you know, the one that's most talked about is um, nephritis, kidney involvement, and um, obviously blood through activation of the immune system, but also we can have anemia and high blood pressure. Um, but less talked about are the um, cardiac involvement um, in lupus. And this is one of the largest killers um, of lupus patients um, currently. And, you know, a lot of the traditional factors that are associated with heart disease don't actually um, pan out or aren't, aren't present in lupus patients. So there's something else going on. We've also been interested in lung disease because of work that we've done on um, pulmonary hemorrhage and COPA syndrome. Um, so these are kind of, you know, this is how our lab thinks about autoimmunity and lupus, thinking about the immune system and how it's contributing to um, autoimmune disease, to tissue involvement. And it's characterized by autoantibodies against nuclear antigens and DNA and RNA. And this is a key feature of lupus. And you know, when you think about it, your nuclear antigens are, are always sequestered away from the immune response. So when there's any defect in clearing up dead or dying cells, that's when these um, antigens, the nuclear proteins, DNA and RNA um, are um, exposed to the immune system. You then get immune complex accumulation, which is also antibodies binding to these antigens. And then these can basically accumulate in various tissues, such as the kidneys, in the lungs, and also um, in, the, in the heart, driving innate immune responses um, and also adaptive, adaptive immune responses. So certainly, you know, we know that there are adaptive immune defects in lupus. So um, loss of tolerance of B cells, so you get autoreactive B cells and the age associated B cells, and um, also defects in um, T helper cell, cell uh, differentiation. So an imbalance between Tregs and TH17 cells that basically can drive autoimmunity. But in the last number of years, um, our thinking around the ro role of the innate immune system um, in driving lupus has really matured. And this has come from seminal work from various members that are on this call that have led um, this kind of resurgence in our understanding of the innate immune responses in lupus. 
for example, you know, probably the, the biggest um, discovery that we've had in the last few years is the understanding that neutrophils, which are the largest population of immune cells um, in our blood, up to up to 40 percent, that these are highly um, these are primed to become activated in, in lupus patients. And when they do, they can um, extrude their DNA in um, neutrophilic cellular, extracellular traps. Um, and this DNA um, and the proteins that are associated with it um, are very immunogenic. But you know, the one of the responses of the innate immune system that is defective um, in lupus is the clearance of apoptotic cells or necrotic and, and cell debris. And this is um, a defect of mac monocytes and macrophages, which is responsible for the in ineffective clearance of both the neut neutrophil extracellular traps, DNA and RNA that's an ant nuclear material that's generated during the process of apoptosis, meaning that the RNA and DNA that is going to drive um, the interferon response or the loss of tolerance um, is hanging around more and the immune response can see it. So, you know, in, in this context, the innate immune response uh, and the defects that we now know are important um, for driving lupus um, really hinge around uh, the, the apoptotic material, DNA, RNA sensing, and then um, inducing uh, antiviral immune responses. They're also responsible potentially for what the Lupus Research Alliance calls the lupus intangibles. And this is the pain, depression, the brain fog and the fatigue that plague um, lupus patients. And these are mechanisms of disease that we really have very little insight, or sorry, these are consequences of disease that we have very little insight um, into, uh, but ones that really um, alter a patient's quality of life. And we have some interest in um, exploring some of this because we know antiviral immune pathways and the type one interferons may be involved. So regarding the epidemiology of lupus, probably the most um, striking feature of um, lupus is that the female to male ratio of affected individuals is nine to one. So it's mostly affecting women in their reproductive years. And, and this is something that has sparked an awful lot of interest amongst many different people trying to understand what's driving this. And th it, it's hardly surprising given what we now know regarding sexual dimorphism in the immune response. You know, up to relatively recently, um, researchers really haven't been looking at sex differences in either tissue responses, organ responses, or immune responses. Um, but I think COVID has really changed our thinking around um, sexual dimorphism in the immune response. Um, and there has always been this understanding that women um, are more prone to autoimmune diseases. They produce more type 1 interferons, which as I'm going to show you, are very important for inducing loss of tolerance. They have a stronger antibody response and they have a stronger T cell response. So they're kind of primed um, towards autoimmunity. Whereas men are more like, are, are, have a higher proportion of um, solid non-reproductive um, cancers. Um, and what characterizes their immune response uh, is that they have a stronger inflammatory response rather than a stronger antiviral response. And the mechanisms that are responsible for sexual dimorphism are multiple. And you know, this is a, a, a whole black box that you could you could take one of each of the things I'm going to mention in the next couple of seconds and spend a lifetime working on this to try and understand how um, these mechanisms are contributing to um, either dysregulation of the immune response in disease or even, you know, sexual dimorphism in the immune response. So kind of two of the most talked about um, aspects of that, that may be driving sexual dimorphism, obviously hormones are important um, and hormones uh, and hormones interact with the immune response and um, quite substantially. Another way of, another way that Another mechanism that can contribute to sexual dimorphism um, uh, is X-linked inactivation. So basically, you know, loss of X-linked inactivation in 
women can lead to um, increased expression of X-linked genes, which have been shown to drive inflammatory responses and particularly antiviral responses. Epigenetics is also an important mechanism of regulating sexual dimorphism. You know, microRNAs, 80% of your microRNAs are actually found in your, on the X, on the X chromosome, uh, whereas the Y chromosome, I think only has 20. So, you know, that in itself shows you that there is a potential for microRNAs um, to regulate um, sexual dimorphism and gene responses. And if you look at um, data, well, looking at data from um, the ImGen data, data set, um, you find that the immune cells that have the greatest sexual dimorphism are actually the macrophages. And when you drill down into this and look at what genes are being um, upregulated in women compared to male um, macrophages, it's the interferon response. So type one interferons, antiviral cytokines, um, that can induce the expression of these interferon-stimulated genes. So you've got this heightened antiviral um, immune response uh, already um, active within your um, macrophages and presumably monocytes. <clears throat> so why is this important? Well, type 1 interferons um, are known to basically break tolerance. And the reason that they want to do this is because these are the key antiviral um, cytokines that are produced in response to detection of viral or bacterial RNA and DNA, and then work to activate the immune response in order to um, activate the, the cells so that they can get rid of the virus and, and present viral antigens, activate CD8 T cells, NK cells, um, and macrophages, um, but also decrease um, the activity of Treg cells um, so that you're not getting in the way of the antiviral immune response. So in all of these ways, type 1 interferons can help break, break tolerance. They can increase dendritic cell, the expression of MHC genes on the um, surface of dendritic cells, increase CD8 cytotoxicity, um, and also enhance inflammation um, from macrophages, and they also induce T B cell switching, class switching, um, to um, more pathogenic um, IgG subtypes. They also have non-immune um, effects. They can influence metabolism, they can drive fibroblast changes, and they can also um, increase adhesion molecules in endothelial cells, um, which is going to um, um, enhance transmigration um, of immune cells um, from the uh, blood vessels into the um, subendothelial space. So lupus is now known to be a type one interferonopathy and early work showed that elevated levels of interferons in lupus patient serum correlated with disease activity. And this was known back um, as far as 1979. Um, and then additional evidence from patients on interferon therapy showed that um, they developed lupus-like syndrome. And these were patients that were been treated for, with interferon for um, malignant tumors um, or for a chronic viral infection. So Lars Romblom and Tim Newald, they were kind of the, the key people who were involved in this initially. And then microRNA analysis showed that PBMCs from lupus patients overexpressed interferon-stimulated genes and that these were a biomarker of disease activity. And now we know that it, we can measure an interferon score. So the interferon stimulated genes in the peripheral blood of lupus patients generate an interferon score um, by measuring the level of the, the, these transcripts and then assigning um, whether the patients have high interferon score or low interferon score. And you can see that there's a natural cutoff here. This is data from our own patients, um, which show, and these patients, the increased interferon score correlates with disease activity and organ involvement in these patients. So why is this important? Well, there has been a number of different attempts to basically target the type 1 interferons, um, and these met, met with mixed results for the treatment of lupus. Um, so rontalizumab and cipolimumab um, targeted the interferons themselves, um, uh, but both failed in clinical trials. And afrolimab, um, has been more successful and has been recently approved for the treatment of, of lupus um, in 2021. But it's 
had mixed results. 48% of patients that underwent these studies, these are the TULIP trials, um, met the end, end goal uh, um, set by the, uh, the clinical trial, whereas 52% were non-responsive. And this kind of raises the question, is targeting the interferon receptor um, sufficient to basically turn off the expression of these interferon stimulated genes. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a subsequent slide. So interferon production and the interferon signature and interferon signaling um, is a key feature of lupus. And um, we've known for a long time now that uh, toll-like receptors seven and nine are critical for driving interferon responses. Um, and Ian Rifkin and Anne Marsha Grothstein uh, were the key um, investigators that showed that TLR9 and then TLR7 were important in, in lupus. We now know that TLR7 is the dominant um, toll like receptor um, that's important for driving interferons um, in lupus. Um, nice work by Mark Schlamczyk showed that there was this dichotomy between TLR9 and TLR7, and actually TLR7 can suppress um, signaling from TLR9. So um, yeah, so it's kind of been a, a confusing story where we initially thought that TLR9 was stimulatory in this pathway, and um, where now we know that TLR7 is dominant. Um, on the other hand, we have these cytosolic RNA and DNA sensors, and these recognize RNA or DNA in the cytosol of cells. And whereas the TLRs are mostly found in um, immune cells, these cytosolic um, receptors are actually found in most cells in the body. So they're more ubiquitous and they have kind of a, a better chance of being um, pathogenic, you know, in different contexts because they're, they're found all over. So the CGAS sting pathway, um, which um, Keith Elkon has worked on um, extensively, is has been, and his group was the first to show that this was really um, relevant for lupus. Um, this has been, you know, is now kind of a key target for um, different drug companies um, and researchers in trying to basically target this pathway, but also understand the contribution of this pathway to driving interferon responses. So what is actually driving this? Well, RNA and DNA are sensed by these receptors. And where does this come from? Well, as I mentioned, RNA from dead and dying cells and um, through lack of clearance of apoptotic cells, necrotic cells, um, nets from uh, neutrophils um, can all be internalized and activate these receptors. Endogenous retroviral elements can also be, have also been shown to be important. And, and this, this is kind of an underexplored element of um, uh, these pathways. And as Christian Lude and um, Mariana Kaplan showed, mitochondrial DNA from damaged mitochondria, particularly oxidized DNA from damaged mitochondria, can also drive um, these pathways. It's released from mitochondria and can activate um, the CGAS sting pathway. Mutations in DNases and RNases that can basically mop up these paths, get rid of exogenous or endogenous RNA DNA have also been described and um, that can contribute to lupus. When the interferons are produced, they bind to the interferon receptor, activate the um, jack staff pathway and drive interferon stimulated um, genes, which are really the, what we're, we measure when we're looking at disease activity. So the focus of my lab has really been understanding the interplay of the environment, sex and gender on these systems, um, both the production of type 1 interferons and signaling downstream of the interferon receptor, um, with the aim of understanding whether there are lupus specific checkpoints that we can target. And then, as I mentioned, and as Thomas mentioned, we we're also interested in translating this to organ specific disease. And the heart is our kind of key, um, is where we're focusing a lot of our efforts at the moment because it's uh, you know, a leading cause of death and a morbidity in patients. And we have an extensive biorepository of lupus samples, RNA, DNA, PBMCs, serum plasma that we've been utilizing for this work. 
so as I said, you know, we're mostly interested in um, monocytes and macrophages and also neutrophils and, and what they're doing and how they're they're regulating and the interferon response in lupus. And, you know, I already mentioned this, that they have this decreased clearance of apoptotic cell debris, but they overproduce interferon stimulatory genes um, and cytokines that can um, drive adaptive immunity. So one of the questions we started looking at was asking whether the overproduction of ISGs within monocytes was all due to transcriptional responses, i.e. activation of the um, jack stat pathway, which would then translocate into the nucleus bind to promoters and drive the expression of these genes, or were there other mechanisms that were regulating this? So we've shown previously that there's a microRNA that's, um, that targets IRF9, Basically, it's an estrogen regulated um, microRNA and it degrades IRF9. And in uh, lupus patients, um, the estrogen receptor and, and estrogen down regulates the expression of this microRNA. So you get enhanced IRF9 expression. And that is sufficient to drive an um, increased expression of ISGs. So this has kind of you know, sp really sparked our interest, kind of wondering whether these downstream epigenetic mechanisms can explain why if you target the, um, the interferon alpha receptor using this blocking antibody, um, that the effects don't work on everybody, i.e. there's a subset of patients that may already have this system primed to be activated. So that's the context for the next um, few slides. So to kind of understand this in more detail, we conducted RNA-seq analysis, and this was done pretty much on, you know, within the first couple of months of me joining CEDARS. And, you know, it didn't surprise us to find that there was this high interferon signature in our lupus patients. But what we did notice, um, you know, what piqued my interest uh, was that there were changes in the expression of genes that were important for amino acid metabolism and um, particular CMPK2, which is actually an interferon stimulated gene, um, and also um, uh, proteins or genes that are important for fatty acid uh, metabolism, um, such as leptin, which has already been reported to be increased in lupus patients, and myelin, which is actually a protein that um, regulates um, leptin and also uh, it's an E3 ligase that can regulate um, steroid, sorry, the S SREBP, which is important for um, cholesterol synthesis and also potentially important for um, DNA sensing. So this really piqued our interest and, you know, got us thinking about whether immunometabolism um, might be important in regulating this, this effect that we see in the monocytes. So mitochondrial dysfunction has been known since um, 2002 to be uh, important in SLE. And this is work from Andrus Pearl's group. And, and they really dominated this, this area for in, in that, that period from 2002 to um, 2012. Um, and they showed that the mitochondria were essential, uh, mitochondria um, were hyperpolarized um, in SLE, SLE T cells. Um, and also that ATP was depleted in these, these cells. And mitochondrial health is obviously very important for um, the state of and the function of all cells, not just immune cells. Um, and you know, it's been shown that mitochondrial dysfunction um, increases as disease severity uh, or inflammation increases. Um, and tip and on the other side, oxidative stress, inflammation, aging, and high fat diets can pr pr promote or help produce um, induce mitochondrial dysfunction. And in lupus T cells, and this is where most of the work has been done, and in lupus is in T cells in lupus, increased mitochondrial mass and size due to increased biogenesis and decreased mitophagy um, have also been um, described again by Andres Pearl's group. And there's an interesting estrogen receptor component here where this um, estrogen receptor or steroid hormone-like um, uh, uh, mitochondrial gene 
um, is decreased in lupus patients and it's actually associated with the SLE1C2 locus um, and mitochondrial dysfunction. So kind of this intriguing um, association between estrogen and estrogen related pathways also. So why is metabolism important? Well, metabolism changes and can reprogram innate immune cell function um, depending on the cell's activity. So when cells are homeostatic, the immune cells and most cells need energy in the form of ATP to survive, grow, reproduce, you know, um, transduce signals and um, make and um, perform specific functions. And so to do that, they energize um, energy much more efficiently by shunting everything through the TCA cycle, which basically through the electron transport chain makes um, the predominant, the, the, um, makes a ATP. So you have glutaminolysis through alpha, making alpha ketoglutarate, driving the cycle, um, acetyl-CoA through the um, oxidation of fatty acids, basically um, coming into the TCA cycle as well. And then you've also got um, glucose um, metabolized to pyruvate, which can either go to acetyl-CoA and enter into the TCA cycle, or can go to lac lactate, um, and, uh, which is the glycolytic pathway. When cells are activated, they need an awful lot more um, energy and much more quickly. So they don't have time to go through all the steps, basically to increase the transport of fatty acids, glutamine, basically activate the TCA cycle to uh, pr produce NADH, which can be fed into the electron transport chain. So they use glucose um, to make lactate and, the, and um, also to activate the pe pentose phosphate pathway, which is a very quick way of um, making ATP. But also what happens to the intermediates on the TCA cycle, they become important intermediates like um, for making amino acids, fatty acids, so that uh, you can increase um, cell signaling. Um, and the proteins in the amino acids are important for, say, cytokine production um, and upregulation of protein expression that's important for cell activation. So basically by changing either whether cells are go through the TCA cycle predominantly, so oxidation phosphorylation, or through glycolysis, you're changing the function of the cells or the, um, the, the uh, effector function of the cells. So activated cells, Th1, Th17 cells, for example, and most of this work was done by um, Eric Pierce and um, uh, Edward Pierce, also Lawrence Morrell, um, looking, at the con looking at this in the context of lupus. They've shown that, um, activated T cells are more glycolytic and that TH17 cells are more gly glycolytic also. Um, also when cells become effector memory cells, they have um, kind of a, a nice balance between glycolysis and the TCA and oxidation phosphorylation, whereas T reg cells have, are predominantly regulated by oxidation phosphorylation. So, you know, there's various different drugs out there that we can use um, to basically modulate whether cells go through glycolysis or go into oxidation phosphorylation. And these have been effectively used to um, switch the immune response from inf inflammation to more immunosuppressive, um, such as the use of metformin and then antioxidants such as n cysteine. So as I said, um, Andres Pearl has driven a lot of the, a lot of the work looking at T cells and T cell immune dysfunction, uh, T cell mitochondrial dysfunction. Lawrence Morel has um, spent has really driven um, the whole area of glucose oxidation has been important for T cell ac activation um, in lupus. But also we have um, a number of different studies that have shown that type one interferons can affect metabolic thickness of um, T cells from patients with lupus. Um, and also that um, type one interferons can change, induce changes in core metabolic function um, and also change, and then doing so basically change immune function. So we know immunometabolism is important for cell reprogramming. Um, and so our question was, was whether there was a link between um, interferons that you see in lupus, this chronic exposure of in, to interferons and metabolic changes in lupus monocytes. And obviously I wouldn't have 
gone into all of this if uh, we hadn't found anything. <laughs> so um, these are CD14 positive um, monocytes from lupus patients. Um, and the, this, this data was, um, this data is representative of 11 separate um, paired uh, patient um, samples and healthy control samples. And you can see that this is looking at the um, seahorse trace um, that the oxidation, oxy oxygen consumption rate, which is a measure of oxidation phosphorylation, is higher um, in the lupus patients compared to the um, healthy controls. Um, so baseline OCR is higher and baseline ECAR, which is a measure of glycolysis, is also higher in the SLE monocytes. What we noticed as we went through this, sometimes we were lucky enough to get two patients on the same day. Um, and when we compared those, those patients um, on the same day, we found that if the patient had high IFI27, which is an interferon stimulated gene, um, if they've high levels of IFI27 in their monocytes, then that corresponded with high levels of um, oxidative consumption rate and also um, the extracellular. Uh, acidification rate, the EPAR, um, suggesting that interferon or the interferon stimulated genes um, might correlate with uh, these changes that we're seeing in, um, in these immunometabolic readouts. So we asked the question whether interferon stimulation of healthy um, control monocytes could induce the similar changes. And indeed, we found that uh, OCR uh, at baseline at baseline levels was um, increased in the um, interferon treated um, healthy control monocytes compared to unstimulated monocytes, and you can see that here. Um, and also, ECAR was also um, increased. So we asked. So we basically turned to some of our colleagues in the proteomic core who um, have uh, have come up with a targeted uh, mass spectrometry assay to basically look at over 32 proteins on uh, both the TCLA cycle, um, pyruvate, uh, sorry, glucose consumption, uh, electron, train, electron chain transporters, um, and also um, enzymes that are important for um, transporting fatty acids and um, other uh, and amino acids um, into the cell. And when we conducted this analysis with them, and so that basically you isolate um, proteins from monocytes, digest them with, um, with trypsin, and then they do targeted mass spectrometry to basically look at the specific, these specific proteins. And one of the key enzymes that was increased and pretty much the only one that was significantly increased actually in our lupus um, patient cells was IDH2. And IDH2 is on the um, TCA cycle and it basically converts isocitric acid to alpha ketoglutarate. Um, and you can see here that um, uh, monocytes um, from healthy controls and SLE patients, and there's uh, this significant difference in IDH2 to expression um, when you compare um, the, the two profiles. And this gives rise to an increased expression of alpha ketoglutarate when we analyze the metabolites um, from these cells, the cytosolic metabolites from these cells as well. So IDH2 is increased in lupus patients and you also have this corresponding increase in alpha ketoglutarate. And when we broke down um, our our analysis of our um, of the IDH2 expression based on disease activity, we found that the higher the disease activity, and um, the higher the IDH2 um, expression. And again, this kind of you know corresponded with um, this the ability of interferons to induce um, the increased OCR and ECAR. So we wondered if they could, um, if interferons could also increase IDH2 expression. And we found that interferon alpha um, when treating THP1s or healthy um, control monocytes um, could indeed induce IDH2 both at the mRNA level and also at the protein level, um, suggesting that IDH2 is actually an interferon stimulated gene. And this is looking at, um, so this is high dimensional flow cytometry looking at um, IDH2 expression in 
um, both healthy control and lupus monocytes. And so the purple group here are classical, lupus, uh, ca classical monocytes, which have a relatively high baseline expression of IDH2, but is increased um, in the lupus patient samples. And, and it's not particularly clear here because we really do need to remove these um, non-myeloid cells from these, uh, from these UMAP plots. Um, but you can see that there are increased expression of IDH2 in both the non-classical and the intermediate um, populations of monocytes here as well. And again, looking at the MFI, IDH2 levels are increased in lupus patients. So this is at the protein level um, uh, compared to healthy controls. And interestingly, um, CIGLEC1 is an interferon-stimulated gene, and we see a, a nice correlation, positive correlation between the levels of IDH2 and CIGLEC1, indicating that there's, um, you know, uh, uh, that there's an association between these genes, which isn't surprising given the fact that both of them are interferon stim stimulated. Um, but it kind of got us thinking about whether the IDH2 and the alpha ketoglutarate rate increases um, could be important for um, interferon stimulated gene expression. So that brings us back to metabolic reprogramming. And, you know, I was talking about how metabolic, so basically, changes in metabolic reprogramming can affect the effector functions of cells. So effector T cells or M1 and macrophages have increased glycolysis, increased glutaminolysis, decreased oxidation, and that promotes inflammation. On the other hand, you have an increased ox, oxfos, increased fatty acid oxidation, and that's going to promote M2 anti-inflammatory macrophage phages, and then these regulatory or memory T cells. But the other side of things is the metabolites that come from the TCA cycle are also important for epigenetic regulation of gene expression and can help program cell phage and function. Um, and so this is what we turn to because now we have IDH2 has been increased and alpha ketoglutarate as a metabolite of the TCA cycle also been increased. So as I said, IDH2 is important for regulating alpha ketoglutarate levels. And if you have increased IDH2, you have increased alpha ketoglutarate. And why is that important? Well, alpha ketoglutarate is an essential cofactor for um, a family of histone demethylases called the KDM, uh, the lysine demethylases. Um, and there's quite a number of this, quite a number of um, these proteins. And um, we have specifically focused on KDM6, A and B, um, as you'll see in, in the next um, slide. So what these do is they basically remove repressive H3K27 trimethylation marks from, um, from, uh, from histone 3. Um, and that basically opens up the chromatin so it's more per permissive or um, active. The other way you can activate chromatin is to increase um, lysine 4 trimethylation on histone 3, H3K4 trimethylation, which again actively opens up um, the chromatin um, so that you can access promoters. Just keep an eye on time. Whoops. Okay. So we asked the question whether alpha ketoglutarate could regulate um, interferon gene expression. Um, interferon stimulated gene expression. And what we did here was we treated cells with a cell permeable version of alpha ketoglutarate, um, dimethyl alpha ketoglutarate, and basically then stimulated with interferon alpha. So the alpha ketoglutarate on its own had no effect, but when you um, stimulate, co stimulate cells with either alpha, with alpha ketoglutarate and interferon alpha, you get this very nice increase in interferon stimulated gene expression. And here, and throughout the next couple of slides, we're looking at IFI 27, although there are a number of um, interferon stimulated genes that we've looked at. And so that got us thinking about trained immunity. So this concept of innate immune, innate immune memory, uh, which a number of groups have shown that it is regulated by uh, metabolites and cellular reprogramming. And the concept here is, is that you're, it's very similar to adaptive immune responses. Your initial exposure gives you your primary response, but now you've basically um, induced epigenetic changes. So the next time you meet um, that 
that challenge and you know most of the work in this has um, come from work on BCG, oxidized LDL and beta-glucan. Then the second exposure to um, the immunogen um, gives this trained response and metabolic reprogramming or rewiring and epigenetic reprogramming have been shown to be key here. And most of the work on this has come from Mihai um, Netia um, and also Luke O'Neill, who I, you know, I trained with as Thomas um, mentioned as well. So they're all, all kind of the key players in this. So acetyl-CoA um, is important for histone acetylation. It's like the, the, the cofactor that's required for this. And alpha-ketoglutarate, as I said, can also um, regulate these lysine demethylases. So we then looked at whether we could train the interferon response um, in monocytes. So we took, took THB1 cells um, and uh, healthy control monocytes primed them with an overnight stimulation with interferon, washed it off extensively, rested the cells for five days, and then came in with the second stimulation. So here's the initial stimulation. So looking at gene expression after 24 hours stimulation with um, interferon alpha. And then here's the cells that were primed with interferon alpha, it was washed off for five days, and then you, then we analyzed, then we re-stimulated with PBS and analyzed um, ISG expression. And you can see that we have a sustained increase in interferon stimulated gene expression. Um, whereas here, this is the kind of the two hit model where we've pre-treated with interferon alpha, and now we've come in again and looked at a stimulate, re-stimulate with interferon alpha, and we got these changes in gene expression, this increased expression of genes. So the cells have been primed to produce these interferon stimulated genes. And mo most importantly, you don't see that response when you look at TNF or HIF1 alpha, which are inflammatory genes, showing that this is specific to interferon alpha. And when we look at um, more global um, gene expression, we get um, at this very nice interferon stimulated gene, um, interferon ISG response um, in the monocytes, um, which correlates when you um, do gene set enrichment analysis to interferon alpha responses and um, interferon gamma responses, um, and also interesting epithelial um, mesenchymal transition. So looking at whether uh, this system, this trained immunity can actually regulate um, methylation of histones at the promoters of ISGs. Uh, we basically conducted an H3K4 trimethylation chip analysis, chromatin immunoprecipitation analysis, and also H3K27 trimethylation analysis. And if so our hypothesis is, is that the increased alpha ketoglutarate is going to reduce H3K27 in the, in the context of trained immunity. And that's exactly what we see here. And we also see an increase in H3K4 trimethylation um, at, at this promoter as well. So it's likely not just going to be the demethylases that are important in this. So as I said, this family of demethylases is quite extensive, but only two of these family members are activatory, i.e. when you remove these, uh, these trimethylation marks, basically you activate gene expression. So these are the two that we focused on, KDM6A and 6B. One of them is UTX, which is on the X chromosome, and then the other one is uh, JMJD3, which is on the uh, on, on chromosome 17. And both of these have been shown to be important in regulating monocyte and um, reprogramming and also inflammation. Um, importantly, you can target both of these using um, a, a GSK molecule called GSKJ4, um, which binds to the active site of these enzymes. And so here are the enzymes here. It's very quite difficult to see. Um, but this is the site that binds um, alpha-ketoglutarate. And basically, the inhibitor binds into the active site, um, which uh, uh, binds to the histone trimethylation, um, and it blocks its binding, and so blocks activity. And here we are look, stimulating cells with interferon alpha, but pre-treating them with GSK, and you can inhibit the um, interferon alpha response in trained immunity, um, suggesting that inhibiting KDM6A and 6B um, is effective in, um, in this context. So we took this to a mouse model and our kind of you know, go-to mouse model is the Pristane model where you can treat the cell mice with PBS or 
um, pristine interperitoneally. Um, then we also co-treated them with GSK J4 or PBS um, at day seven, and then we sacrificed them 28 days, uh, sorry, eight days later, 24 hours later. And we found that in the peritoneal monocytes that um, GSK J4 treated uh, mice showed a reduction in um, ISG expression, um, and, and which we found, which was, which was, um, which, and basically ISG 15 and also CXCL 10. But to look at whether there was an effect on um, the pathology of lupus, we switched to another model. Um, because it's a, another quick model of uh, lupus, but it's also, uh, you see renal involvement as well. And this is the Resiquimod model, where you basically apply Resiquimod to the ears of the mice, um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, basically, um, and it's a topical ap application for four to five weeks. And this induces splenomegaly, as you can see here, um, and, and this is uh, shown here in this graph. You also get increased IgG1 um, expression in the serum, increased serum creatinine, um, and also increased expression of ISGs um, in the kidney. So using this model, um, we showed that GSKJ4 could reduce um, in, uh, serum creatinine in the um, R848 treated mice, also could reduce IgG1, um, and could also reduce the expression of IFI 27, this representative ISG that we have, um, that we, we, we look at in the kidneys of the mice. And there's, you know, it, it's not a, not a very profound effect, but we are seeing a reduction of IgG deposition um, in the kidneys um, and potentially some reduced um, cellularity in the kidneys as well in the mice that are treated with um, GSK J4. So just finally, um, does this translate to human disease? Well, um, yes, we, here's um, IFI 27 in our lupus patients. And as I said, these patients have a very high basal level of um, ISG expression. And if you, pre -treat, if you treat these cells overnight with GSKJ4, you can basically um, completely inhibit or, um, this, this response. Um, and this is also seen at the protein level if we look at SIGLEC1 expression on uh, monocytes as well. Um, and it can also, as I showed earlier, in inhibit interferon-induced responses in both healthy controls and in the lupus patient cells. So this work um, is all unpublished and has been submitted to um, arthritis and rheumatism. We're just revising a couple of things, including doing cut and run. Um, to basically look at more global effects of GSKJ4 and um, trained immunity in this, in this model. But basically what we have here is that interferon alpha can increase IDH2 and alpha ketoglutarate and then open up these um, ISG promoters through, through activating either KDM6A or 6B. And in lupus monocytes, Basically, they're primed, <clears throat> sorry, they already have this IDH2 expression and alpha ketoglutarate expression um, upregulated so that the ISGs are, are constitutively open. And the idea is that here is that we could use J GSKJ4 to close these, um, these promoters uh, and basically rescue this ISG expression in monocytes. And, um, you know, these. Uh, TCA metabolites are not just important for epigenetic regulation, um, but they can also regulate signaling pathways. And, you know, it's good to always think about the mitochondria as a signaling um, organelle. And so fumarate um, uh, can accumulate if you inhibit um, the fumarate hydratase, which basically catalyzes um, fumarate to malate, I believe. And that basically fumarate works inside the mitochondria to help export mitochondrial RNA or mitochondrial DNA, um, which can then activate Rig I, MDA5 pathway or um, the CGAS sting pathway. And they, these were in back-to-back -back papers in Nature, and, and we were lucky, lucky to be part of um, the Hoofman et al. Uh, paper, uh, which was of which Luke was a senior author. Um, and here you know, they basically found this enhanced interferon signature in the cells that were inhibited with this 
um, fumarate hydratase inhibitor. Um, and that got them thinking about lupus. So they came to us and asked, you know, could we look at fumarate hydratase expression um, in lupus patient samples? And so looking at our repository and looking at mRNA expression in the repository, we found that FH expression was substantially reduced in the lupus um, blood samples compared to healthy control, suggesting that FH expression um, could be, reduction of FH expression could be important um, in promoting RNA um, release from mitochondria. And this is in the context of um, monocytes uh, in the case of the O'Neill paper. Um, but these guys here, uh, Sakini et al. showed that um, C-gas sting pathway and DNA release uh, was also promoted by um, fumarate um, and this is in kidney cells. So there's a potential implication for nephritis as well uh, with these findings. So let me just skip on. This is kind of where we're going next. Uh, with very interesting sex differences um, in lupus and in also metabolic reprogramming of immune cells. And we have funding now to look at um, differences in lupus and healthy control. Um, PBMC is looking at uh, epigenome, uh, the transcriptome, the proteome, and the metabolome. And we know that there are differences in IDH2 expression in both males and females. In fact, males have higher IDH2 expression um, than females, but males have higher expression of KDM5D, which is an inhibitory um, demethylase. So there may be an imbalance in these demethylases between um, healthy controls and, sorry, in between males and females that might um, alter this epigenetic regulation. So bringing it all together, um, we're very interested in, in this system. And this, this, this work has all stemmed from um, an interdisciplinary collaboration between myself and Noel Barry Murs in cardiology and lupus in Cedars. Um, and, it, it, you know, this kind of bringing together of uh, these interdisciplinary approaches, such as advanced cardiac imagery, we're now interested in the gut microbiome, given the fact that in the new um, Autoimmunity Institute here at Cedars, we also have the micro human microbiome uh, core right next door to us. And so this kind of, you know, bringing all these together, I think, is probably the next um, most exciting way that we can um, maximize our understanding of what's going on in the immune response and how it's contributing to uh, pathology um, in lupus. Okay, so sorry, I kind of rushed that last bit because I was conscious of time, but I um, just want to acknowledge all the people that were involved, and particularly Erica, who's now left, and Mamita, um, and then all of my collaborators within the Division of Rheumatology and the Smith Heart Institute. And thank you all for your attention. Sorry, I haven't left much time for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. That was a very fascinating uh, talk. And I'm wondering if there are some questions. Uh, I, can see, I can see one here uh, coming from Keith Elkon. Uh, do you know whether the KDM inhibitor only inhibits the interferon response or have other effects? No, we haven't. Uh, we haven't looked at uh, any other genes. We have. We've, we're in the process of doing some um, uh, cut and run experiments and some uh, RNA seq experiments to look at that, so we can answer that question. Um, I would imagine that yes, it has extensive effects um, because it's a histone demethylase, and you know it's bound to work on work on many different um, uh, gene networks. But uh, whether, you know, what exactly is happening, we don't know. And until we do the cut and run and the RNA-seq experiments to basically balance up uh, and to, to work out these gene, re gene regulatory networks, um, it'll be difficult to tell. But yeah, absolutely, a fascinating question. So just to follow up on that a little bit, um, I assume that uh, GlaxoSmithKline develop this inhibitor for oncology indications, but do you know if there's any thought by them or anybody else to uh, give them a try in lupus? No, I mean, I, I haven't, because this work is unpublished as yet, um, I haven't, I, I don't think there's been any interest in that, re that respect. And also um, these KDM6 
A and B um, and GSK inhibitor have been shown to have kind of opposite effects depending on the cell types and, and the conditions where, they're, where they've been used or examined. Um, so there, there's probably quite a lot to work out with respect to these enzymes, and it's not as clear as I, uh, you know, as I, as I presented. Um, so there has been work that's shown that uh, uh, alpha ketoglutarate and IDH2 can reprogram immune cells to be anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. or program them to be um, pro-inflammatory, you know, M1-like in the context of inflammatory disease. And there are two separate publications in the last couple of years. So. Um, you know, it, it, it really, it could be, it could be um, lupus patient specific, which would be great. Um, so really another approach that we could take is looking at um, RA patients or IBD patients and seeing if there's a similar effect or mm -hmm. you know, in those, in those patient groups as well. Yeah. But a great question. Okay, thanks. I, I have multiple other questions, but I think I'm going to leave them to uh, when we have a one-on-one -on -one in a, in a moment and I think we are at the hour and I don't see any other questions. So let's just uh, thank the speaker and, and move on. So thanks very much, Caroline. Oh, you're welcome. You thank you. Thank you all for listening.